Midway USA brand product designers have one straightforward goal. Develop high-quality, technically sound products and deliver them to customers at reasonable prices. If you are immersed in the shooting sports industry and pay close attention to every single detail, you know our products are built right and stand up to everyday use. Who has shooting mats and range bag systems to hunting clothing and just about everything for the outdoors? Log on and shop 24-7 with super fast shipping. MidwayUSA.com Fishing like a local isn't just about catching fish. It's about connecting with the environment and the people who call it home. It's about hearing the stories and traditions that have been passed down for generations and sharing unforgettable moments with the people you meet along the way. Fishing like a local is having an experience that stays with you forever. And with Fishing Booker, you can experience it too, no matter where you are. Discover your next adventure on Fishing Booker. Welcome to the Casting Across Fly Fishing Podcast. I'm Matthew of castingacross.com, where I explore the quarry and culture of fly fishing. All right, here's the deal. Uh, 11th hour change, but this is going to be a good podcast. I just know it, because what we're going to talk about today is how amazing a one-hour margin time fly fishing excursion can be. This is not what I planned on talking about. What I planned on talking about was gift getting in anticipation of Father's Day. Not to say that Mother's Day or any other holiday isn't a good day for fly fishing gift giving, but I really wanted to get some good items that maybe are outside of the box, maybe some things I don't already have, but the kind of things that I look for when I want to receive a gift or give it a gift within fly fishing. So I still have a couple of weeks before Father's Day, so that episode will be next week, if not the following week. So we're going to talk about this fly fishing trip that I went on. And a trip is a vast exaggeration or overstatement. This was a one-hour margin time fly fishing outing. Before I get to that, something kind of new and different, I got some really cool stickers, uh, Casting Across stickers. I like them a lot. It's a humpy in the colors of Casting Across, which is kind of that um, warm, dark gray and that burnt orange. So if you want one, here's how you can get one. Send me an email, matthew at castingacross.com. DM me on Instagram, at castingacross. The first 10 requests I get, get one for free. I will mail it to you. No shipping and handling even. How about that? That's a special little deal. So definitely reach out if you want one. If you're one of the first 10 to ask, then it is yours. So anyway, on to the podcast today. So I talk about margin time fly fishing. I've been talking about that concept for years on casting across. And what I mean by that is keep a rod and reel and some flies in the car because you never know when you're going to stumble across a stream and you might have 15 minutes or an hour to kill. That can be just an opportunity to get out on the water and cast. It can be an opportunity to get into a big fish. And yesterday I had such an opportunity. So I had some errands to run late in the day. I had a lunch meeting, uh, kind of a town to the west of me. And that lunch meeting fell through. But I had already kind of scheduled it. I was already kind of out in that direction. So what I did was headed to a stream that I fished a handful of times. But in the wintertime, I drove by and I noticed the water was not looking normal. And I kind of got concerned because I thought, you know, what's happened here is there been a problem with the stream, a problem with the stream flow. It's a really small brook trout creek. And so I was concerned if there's any giant uh, shift in the ecosystem that it could prove detrimental to this fragile trout population. So I hopped out of the car, this is back in the winter, and I walked upstream and I realized that some beavers had gotten to work. And initially I was incredibly agitated, thought, you know, I'm going to start tearing this down myself. It's not my property and it's probably not legal, but that was my first thought. But then I thought, you know what, this is what nature does. This is more normal and natural than building a bridge over it, you know, for a highway. Much more normal and natural than doing grading or channeling for a development. So let's just see what happens. And there's potentially some good things that could come of this. So anyway, I was over in this neck of the woods yesterday and I thought, let me swing by. I have uh, a little one weight and my boots in the car and I'll, I'll check this out. So I pull up and this was the first thing that happened. This is very, very exciting. I had been fishing in the salt. The stripers aren't quite up at my beach yet. They're definitely in the area, but 
I haven't seen any reports of them at the beach that I fish at, but I was still out fishing for stripers on Monday. So I had my waders out with me. And when I got home, I rinsed them off because I'm super paranoid about salt causing corrosion and rust and all that junk on my parts of my waders and my boots. So I got them very, very wet. And then I hung them up to dry and threw them in my car before work just so I'd have them in my car for the week. And I go to put my waders on and foot one goes in no problem foot two goes in and it is a unique and odd situation to put your foot into a waiter leg and have it be wet up to the ankle because what had happened was I rinsed these things off so thoroughly that I got water inside of them and I neglected to turn them upside down to let all that water drain out so that was my first exciting thing so I had a very wet foot the entire time I might as well have wet weighted but Honestly, to keep the ticks and the burrs and the crud off me, it was worth wearing the chest waders. Anyway, I get to the water, and I immediately make my way to this beaver dam, thinking, okay, what's the situation? Where, What does this look like? The water looked great below it, so I was pretty pumped thinking that we were going to be in good shape. But I got to the beaver dam, and this is a spring creek, and the water is crystal clear. It's incredibly cold, and it's pretty quick moving. It's a relatively moderate gradient for being where it is, not in the mountains or anything. And I get to the beaver dam, and the water behind it is dark. It is just one shade short of black. It is tannin stained. There's all sorts of dark, dark earth, as well as pine trees all over the place. And so it is just a dark, dark uh, little spot in the in the water. And also it is covered in those little seeds, little helicopter seeds. They're all over the place. So it's just a really weird scene. So I had tied on a uh, pattern that I was kind of working on over the fall and winter. And what it is, it's a modified Mickey fin. And I tied it, instead of using all bucktail, I used yellow bucktail and red, kind of dark orange marabou. That way, the fly pulsates a little more. I mean, bucktail does have a little bit of movement, but the marabou has a lot of movement. So I use that real webby marabou, which I'm using more and more. I mean, I'm not going to use it on the tails of my woolly buggers or anything like that, but the webby stuff is awesome to replicate gills, to replicate fins, just to kind of give the body of a fly a little bit of motion. So that's what these uh, Mickey fin variants are. And I'm also using a scud hook. And here's kind of the, the lesson or the, or the moral of the story. The scud hook, the idea of that was that it's a little bit more of a bulky hook and it allows that hook to stay oriented properly, that fly to stay oriented properly, and it's going to reduce that thing twisting. And swinging the fly and allowing the current to move the fly, that is absolutely what happens. But I noticed something because I was stripping this fly across this little beaver pond and I was getting so many short strikes thinking what in the world's happening there's no way that these fish can be that finicky or that you know they're, they're just going after the tail and it wasn't that they were going after the tail it's that that fly has awesome action on the swing which is a great way to fish it but when i'm retrieving it it causes that hook point to drop down and the bucktail and the marabou to stay kind of level. So it kind of pulls it apart. So imagine kind of like how a, a squid <laughs> moves through the water, kind of moving its, its legs uh, away from each other as it uh, kind of pulsates through the water. That's basically what this fly does. So it was a major design flaw. And so what I need to figure out, go back to the drawing board, is redesign it so I have the same marabou and bucktail uh, action going on, but use a different hook, probably just a traditional, maybe 3x long streamer hook to really straighten this pattern out um, and, and maybe just make sure all the materials are on the top of the hook so I can still avoid that twisting. But that's a great thing for me to see. The water was dark, but not dark enough that I couldn't figure out what was happening with this fly while I was missing these fish. Well, I mean, hopefully you see the exciting part of this story. There were so many brook trout in this pond. I mean, this pond wasn't huge. It's just a little beaver pond, but there was so many brook trout in it, and I saw big orange flashes. And by big, I'm talking 8 inches, 10 inches, because this is a really, really tiny brook trout pond now in the middle of this little brook trout stream. But it, I, I'd never seen a concentration of fish, period, but large fish in a spot like that before. 
it was awesome for fishing that place for you know probably four or five years and fishing it a couple times a season because it is really really small little creek and I don't like to pressure it too much and I never see footprints from anybody else so I don't think a lot of people know about it let alone fish it it was so cool to see how this significant alteration to the ecosystem had immediately had an impact on the fish now could it have been that these fish were always there and just much more spread out maybe but then what happened afterwards after i fished in that little pond for maybe about half an hour i walked downstream fishing through the parts of the water that looked very normal a little bit lower water because of the impeded flow but all the fish that i was expecting to see were also in those spots and it was just a, a really exciting thing for me to see that the fish were not only not negatively impacted by this beaver dam, but they actually seemed to be positively impacted. Uh, it was cool too, and if, if you've ever had this experience of fishing tannin-stained waters uh, and, and, and still water, that the fish that I caught out of that new beaver pond were in significantly darker. They had kind of the black speckled bellies on the on the white, and their sides had much more purple going on versus the ones I caught even maybe 10 yards downstream in the creek itself. Much brighter, much more vibrant, uh, that neon orange fins and milky white bellies. So it's just really cool to see that adaptation. And, and if you fish, you know, those are the kind of things that really can get you into it and just get you appreciating what you're doing would it have been nice to catch a 16 or 18 inch brook trout yeah it, it, it is incredibly improbable in a stream like this further downstream where it gets wicked swampy and has uh, some outlets into some bigger rivers maybe they're down there but that's not fun waiting and that's not fun fishing but for where i was to be able to catch a fish that I could cast in one direction and the thing is incredibly dark and has one pattern and if I were to cast in the other direction it looks completely different that's the kind of stuff that kind of really gets me going when it comes to this small stream trout fishing so a couple morals to this story uh, the first is you know don't count nature out it was designed to adapt and it was designed to be very very flexible and malleable we sometimes get so bad out of shape when what we perceive to be normal changes but for those fish i guarantee you they have not blinked an eye they have not batted a fin secondly uh think about your fly patterns that you're tying they may look good in one setting but then you apply a different set of variables and it changes completely i've had the same thing happen with some dry flies that i've tied especially ones where i've substituted foam for uh, um, the, the body where they float super well if i'm fishing kind of an upstream drift but if i'm fishing uh, either parallel with myself or somewhat downstream as soon as i go to retrieve that fly it'll pull itself underwater um, just has to do with the shape of the body and I have to make some adjustments to that and really make sure that that foam is on the top of the hook otherwise it's going to submerge and make that big popping sound and create a wake and so it's bad news so two exact same pieces of water but just the style of fishing can change it and that was true with this little streamer this uh, Mickey fin uh, modification that I made it fishes great on the swing it is beautiful and the the hook is is nice and large it also keeps that fly uh, in, in a proper orientation in the water but as soon as you started stripping that it was causing problems although it's kind of cool I mean really who doesn't like catching you know 30 brook trout in an hour um, and, and I could have caught way more than that if I would have hooked up on every fish that took a swipe at this thing. And, and it could have been the same fish over and over again. But uh, it was actually kind of fun after a while to strip this thing in and watch how many fish were taking swirls at it, how they were coming up. And uh, they were busting through big mats of, of uh, pine needles and things like that to go after this fly. So that was a, a good thing for me to see. Okay. I was able to pay attention to this, see the fish chasing it, seeing why I was missing them, and be able to go back to the, the bench and the vise and make the proper modifications. So, and then the last one, of course, is make sure you turn your waders upside down and uh, drain the water out of them. But all that to say, that wasn't an hour of fishing. It probably wasn't even an hour. It, it probably was an hour, including me parking and getting dressed, getting rigged up, walking to the water, goofing around a little bit, 
and then fishing and I caught I don't even know how many brook trout and that is kind of the 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 main thing I want to communicate is it wasn't a great day of fishing I mean was it uh, multiple nights uh, up at a lodge somewhere where I was catching really big fish and really getting down into it and, and having all my gear on me and and hanging out with people and just that whole big fishing experience no but for a busy work week and this week and last week and next week and a lot of the weeks around it are incredibly busy you know this was a good outing heading to the local pond and and having all of my boys fishing and then when one of them goes to the playground and I can cast his spinning rod for a few minutes and I catch a couple of bass that's good quality fishing do I have legit trips on the calendar I do of course uh, do I have plans even next week to get out on the water and fish a little bit more uh, focused manner I do but this hour here and this hour there is the kind of stuff that keeps you plugged in it makes it not feel so uh, anxiety riddled when you don't have a fishing trip on the calendar and what it also does is it makes it so you you don't press so much um, you know if, if you've ever played baseball or, or a sport that requires a lot of focus and concentration if you're in a slump uh, that is the worst mental state to be in when you face that next pitcher because you're thinking I haven't caught a fish I haven't cast I need to catch I need to to catch a fish right now and so you might forsake the things that you know to do by defaulting to what you feel most comfortable with you might be in this pattern of changing flies time and time again just because you haven't caught a fish for a long time or you haven't even cast a fly rod for a long time I find as long as I have that rod in my hand every now and again if I'm just getting a little bit of fishing here and there and that is really going to put me at ease and make my more um, you know significant fishing trips I'm going to be in a much better state to start those off um, I feel like you're always the best angler after a day of fishing you're always the the best fisher um, after you've been fishing because that's when you you can slow down that's when you are a little bit more loose uh, that's when you are kind of in tune with your gear even if it's your favorite rod but if you're only fishing maybe once a month even your favorite rod is going to require a little bit of getting used to that's like last week i talked about getting a guide on day one i think getting a guide on day one is great because you just you're following instructions all you're doing is paying attention to what they tell you to do and when you do that then it takes a huge burden off of you so a lot of those things kind of you know thrown into the same pot and boiled down to its its you know least common denominator it just shows that getting out on the water can be incredibly therapeutic and incredibly beneficial so carry stuff in in your car at all times but that being said if it's starting to get hot where you are just be aware of that you know gear is incredibly uh, durable your fly line is going to be probably the thing that's going to not like getting hot um, the most um, and if you were to have like a bamboo fly rod that's not gonna enjoy being in the back of a hot humid car on those 85 95 degree days when it gets much much hotter when it's all closed up and the sun's beating down on it so what I like to do is I like to make sure everything's in a case and then I will throw a blanket over stuff to add just a little bit of insulation it's amazing how how that keeps things cool and I also think about my flies too you know everything that you put in a fly especially once you start using cements and epoxies and things like that they are ridiculously durable I mean they're designed to engage in and encounter really harsh elements and situations at the same time heat is the worst thing for any one of the natural or artificial materials that goes into your fly box and other things like that I mean even little things like your floatant um, your, your floatant will turn liquid unless you have good stuff I will say the loon stuff it maintains its consistency even when it's crazy hot um, I've, I've been burned by liquid floatant so so often that I get really paranoid when I pop open my little cap of loon floatant and uh, I always expect it to run all over the place but it doesn't so I'm, I mean I haven't fished in 105 degree weather but under most situations it still performs but a little bit rambly all that to say if you keep stuff in your car take care of it you know if, if you know you're not going to be fishing you're not going to have any margin time for the five days in the hottest time of year 
then then don't don't throw it back there. That being said, guess what? I have a Tenkara rod. I always have in the car, just just because I don't want to be caught without it. Um, then why without it? I mean, an opportunity to fish. So it's not my preferred method of of fishing or fly fishing or, or whatever you want to call Tenkara, but at least I have a rod and a little bit of line and tippet and a like a stimulator or a, um, a big atoms with a, a big sparkly post on it and i have a couple flies and all that stuff so i'm ready to go at any time because you might have an experience like i had yesterday where you get into dozens and dozens of fish in very very short order so margin time fly fishing um, a fun little look at how an hour taught me a couple things you know Make sure your waders get turned inside out or upside down after you've rinsed them out with a hose in your backyard. Um, trust that nature is going to self-correct and might make things better than you expected. And uh, don't be afraid to fail at the fly tying bench and go back to the drawing board because it'll turn turn things better. All right. This week on castingacross.com, uh, the first article is called Fly Fishing Books. It's the 10th uh, edition of of fly fishing books. So uh, I talk about some pretty well known books like Fifty More Places to Fly Fish Before You Die by Chris Santella, kind of a standard coffee table book in the fly fishing world, as well as Presenting the Fly by Lefty Cray, his big thick tome of technique and tactics, and then two other cool books, Traverse Corners uh, by Scott Waldy, which is a fiction story about a small town in in uh, Montana. And that was actually a recommendation from a listener or a reader of Casting Across, and they recommended it. I went out and bought it and the two sequels, and I absolutely love it. So if you have a book recommendation, let me know. Hey, if you're an author and you have a book, I would love that also. And then the, the fourth book I recommend is called Downstream, and this is a very different book. It's called Downstream by uh, a gent's name O'Hara and Dickerson, and it is a fly fishing book, but fly fishing is really the setting for some other things that it's, it's talking about. It's a, a good book, and it's one that I, I want to revisit and explore and maybe do something else with the casting across here in the new future, but check out those books. If you are not a reader, or you are a reader and you don't have a lot of fly fishing books, then not to, to toot my own horn, but uh, to, to give you some resources, I have well over um, 50 books that I have some sort of review on and for on castingacross.com. On the right-hand side of the website, if you're on the uh, web browser whether for your desktop or a tablet, I'm not sure where it pops up on a mobile device, there's an article called Fly Fishing Books, and it is just a aggregate of all the book reviews. And my book reviews are usually just a paragraph long. If you ever have a question about another one of the books that's, that's on here, um, don't hesitate to reach out. Matthew at castingacross.com. Happy to give you kind of more details on what I think about it. Or if you are looking for a particular type of book, then I'm happy to give my recommendations. I think that reading is just a, an awesome thing in general. And it's something that we have in our fly fishing heritage. And it's worth kind of uh, staying staying on top of. So if you want to build up your library, Fly Fishing Books and this week's article, Fly Fishing Books X, the 10th edition. Wednesday's article is called Trout and Feather for May of 2021. So uh, I have been collaborating with Tim Camisa from Trout and Feather, an awesome fly tying and fly fishing website and YouTube channel for a year now. I do one article a month that he puts on his website, he puts in his newsletter, and then I publish it uh, in part on Casting Across, but also with a couple of links to some of his fly tying videos, which is the kind of content that I don't do. So I want to expose you, the listener, and then the folks over on the website, the readers, to that because it is different. So this month's article was actually uh, a part two of a podcast I did a while ago. The podcast was called A Pinch of Salt for the Trout Crowd, and this article is called Mixing a Little Salt In. And it's basically the idea that die in the wool, uh, hardcore, uh, just old-timey trout fishers, like I used to be, think that saltwater fishing is a completely different game. And in a lot of ways it is, but it's not that hard to make the switch as long as you think of it in some different terms. You know, you keep your casting mechanics, you read the water, but beyond that, it's a very, very different ball game. So I talk about four things that you shouldn't do, to, that you should, things that you don't do if you're walking out 
into the saltwater flats or walking out into a jetty with a fly rod if you're a trout angler and you want to catch a striped bass or a bluefish or something like that. So there's that article as well as a couple of fly tying videos and, and one on Euro nymphing that Tim talks about. He says that Euro nymphing is cheating. I think I agree, but I agree in the in the way that he means it. So it's a it's a pretty mild form of cheating. This week's recommendation on the podcast is actually uh, kind of another spur of the moment thing because I, I have a bunch of products I'm saving for, for next week or the, the podcast on gift giving, but it is Tim Camisa's Instagram live feeds. So Tim's been doing these at least once a week and he's doing them through the summer and he gets on and he talks fly tying live with anybody on Instagram uh, and he also includes other people on it. So this week, actually, I was on it. And he just goes back and forth with fly tires and people like me who try to tie flies and ask some questions, get some input, gets input and questions from his audience. And it's a really good crowd of people and a very diverse group of people. And it's just a good way to get some quick kind of off the cuff, spur of the moment uh, feedback from other anglers and fly tires, as well as some of Tim's expert tips. So Tim's handle is at Trout and Feather, all spelled out, and he's definitely worth following on Instagram. And then when you see his little thing pop up saying that he's going live, then definitely tune in and see who might show up because he knows a lot of folks in the fly fishing world, and so you never know who might pop up on one of his Instagram live uh, events. I'll put a link to his profile on the show notes on this podcast page on castingacross.com. Thanks for listening to the Casting Across Fly Fishing Podcast. Please subscribe in your favorite podcast app and rate the podcast on iTunes. Then head over to castingacross.com where you'll find more info on this podcast and three posts a week on the people, places, and things that go into the pursuit of fish. that has the stories to back it a life to be proud of it's a winchester life yeah baby six eight western oh, i'll be over there baby right there tune in every tuesday at 7 p.m eastern on waypoint tv in wild country rules were not created by man don't miss wild country wednesdays from 7 to 11 p.m eastern presented by primos speak the language waypoint tv the destination for outdoor entertainment